We're talking Washington Commanders football on the Prime Sports Network YouTube channel. Just finished uh, a quick uh, little video that we did on the Our Lads Football Network YouTube channel. We'll have a link in the description here, of course. You can check that out. Uh, and uh, this is going to be an opportunity for me to go a little bit more in-depth with David Harrison. Uh, and uh, matter of fact, David, uh, you might know David. We've done a lot of Tampa Bay Bucks talk here on the channel uh, for the last few years, we're finally making the switch over to the Washington Commanders. Uh, James Yarcho was on representing the Bucks last week. So that was great. It was uh, real interesting to have him on for the first time. So now we're having uh, David on to talk Washington Commanders football. And also want to remind everybody to check the description, the, uh, the links in the description for uh, the podcast that David does, the Locked On Commanders podcast on YouTube. So we'll have links for that as well. David, thanks for doing this again. Yeah, man. Appreciate the invite as always. All right, David. So let's get right to it. And I want to, uh, obviously everything's new in Washington and I guess the fan base has got to be stoked about that new owner, mm -hmm. new head coach, new GM, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and also by the way, uh, is there a new stadium on the way? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, there will be a new stadium on the way when and where and all that stuff is still to be determined, but yeah, Josh Harris, uh, the managing partner of the ownership group, uh, has made no, you know, there's, there's no, secret about that they're they're looking and actively doing research on where the new stadium will be practice facility all that stuff may not necessarily all be located one like right now the current practice facility and head headquarters is in ashburn virginia the stadium is in landover maryland you could have a similar type of arrangement uh moving forward even with the new stadium but uh you know new new digs are, are coming certainly in the relatively near future for the washington commanders Okay, so uh, let's get right to it. I've got the Arlads depth chart, which we'll also have a link in the description for that uh, for Washington. And uh, let's we'll start with the offense because this is really what everybody wants to know. Every, the quarterback position, Washington, they're going to get a draft one. So the question is who it's going to be. It seemed now we just did a, a mock draft a couple of days ago. Dave Syverson had Washington, and he said, well, what I've been hearing, uh, and I guess what some of the news out there is – Maybe they're leaning towards uh, Jaden Daniels at this point. I'm, I mean, just so you know, David, not sure if you've checked out the R Lads draft guide yet, but it, there's a consensus between the top scouts at R Lads, Dave Syverton, who of course is one of them, and even me. And we did this about three months ago, where me and David both agreed that we thought Jaden Daniels was the top quarterback in his class. We're in mutual agreement upon that. So if Washington can end up with Daniels as the uh, as, as their quarterback, uh, I think they'd be in great shape. Do you think that's the direction they're going to go? I mean, that's the, that's the way it feels to me. Jane Daniels, uh, especially since the trade of Sam Howell, like before they traded Sam Howell to the Seattle Seahawks, you know, I, I kind of kept the the belief alive that at least there was an opportunity or a chance that maybe Washington trades backs, collects more draft picks, sees how the quarterbacks fall, and if there's one there that they just absolutely have to take. Uh, whatever position they fall back to, they go ahead and still take them. If not, then they go ahead and build around Sam Howell for a year and then see how Sam can do with an, an arguably better coaching staff, better roster around him, and, and make a decision on the quarterback position starting in 2025 moving forward. However, once they traded Sam Howell, that's pretty much all bets are off. Now it's it's quarterback as a primary need, and so you have to go after him. doesn't mean you have to go after them at number two, but if there's a guy that just kind of fits what you're trying to do and fits your style of play and fits your scheme, uh, you know, to the to the maximum extent, why wouldn't you take him, right? And when you look at uh, what Dan Quinn and Adam Peters, the new head coach and GM in Washington, have been saying about the style of football they want to play, they want to be aggressive, they want to be explosive, uh, they want to take opportunities when they're given to them, and specifically to the quarterback position. They want a guy that can push the ball down the field. They want a guy that can extend plays and make plays on his own. They want a game changer. And when you look at these quarterbacks uh, at the top of this board, Caleb Williams certainly could be put in the game changer uh, uh, you know, class. But Jane Daniels is pretty much that next guy. And then you add on Cliff Kingsbury uh, and what he's been done or been doing in his coaching history. You know, there, there's a lot more run game in his NFL coaching history than a lot of people realize. But when the team passes, they do want to push the ball down the field. And he loves himself a quarterback that can move around, make things happen and create with his legs. And that's I mean, again, it's, it's Jane Daniels. Uh, to a T. I even did an episode recently on Locked On Commanders where I pulled up a draft uh, uh, scouting report on on a quarterback prospect. Read it off, said to my listeners, "It sounds exactly like Jaden Daniels, but it's actually Kyler Murray." Now, obviously, Jaden is taller than <laughs> Kyler Murray, which certainly could help him. But when you look at some of the skill set that both these guys bring into the league, it fits Cliff Kingsbury. And now, again, Cliff has been in the NFL, got fired, 
certainly could change his stripes a little bit. But when you look at the relationships here, Adam Peters and Dan Quinn, their relationship with Cliff Kingsbury is going against him. They've never worked with him directly. They've never been in the same organization, never been on the same team. They've only gone against him. So they've hired him because of how difficult he was to beat running his system, his style of play with the Arizona Cardinals. They didn't hire him to change him. They hired him because of what he already is. What he already is fits Jaden Daniels the most out of any of the remaining quarterback prospects. All right. Well, again, uh, we would all be in agreement there. And uh, for Commanders fans, I certainly hope that that is the player that they wind up turning to. Okay. So let's talk about the rest of this offense quickly. And uh, left tackle seems to be a big question as well. Uh, right now, uh, our lads has Braden Daniels there because he was a fourth round draft pick last year, even though he didn't mm -hmm. play. So, is there any chance that Braden Daniels could get the opportunity to start at left tackle, even though there's still another player there like Cornelius Lucas, you know, a veteran uh, who, who could certainly also wind up at that spot. And considering that they're going to be using that top pick on a quarterback, they're not going to be able to get that left tackle right away. So what, what is the prognosis as far as left tackle? Yeah, I don't think Braden Daniels is going to be in contention for the starting job there at the left tackle position. I think right now, if you had a pencil in a starter, it would be Cornelius Lucas. Okay. Uh, talking to Adam Peters in Orlando during the annual NFL League meetings, uh, he he was asked by another beat reporter, uh, how do you plan on addressing the hole at left tackle? And he specifically said, well, I don't think it's a hole. I think we have pretty good confidence in Cornelius Lucas there on the left side. So I think right now inside the organization, Cornelius Lucas is your you know in pencil left tackle. But I do expect okay. the Washington Commanders to go – somewhat early top 50 top 40 after a left tackle maybe even trade uh, a couple of those those five day two picks that they have currently in their possession package them up uh trade try to trade back into the first round i've got my eye kind of on the seattle seahawks at number 16 they've kind of been known for moving back i don't know if they'd be willing to move completely out of the first round from 16 that's the biggest question or if they would want a future first round pick uh, from a team in order to do so and i don't know if washington would be willing to do that so there are some obviously some hurdles to to executing a trade like that but if the commanders can get into that 15 16 range early uh, or late teens ahead of the tw the 20s then you can be looking at a guy like talisi fuaga out of oregon state which could certainly be good or if somebody likes fuaga more than they like olufashanu maybe the big penn state left tackle falls and you can go ahead and nab him up uh, but either way i do expect the washington commanders to address the left tackle position specifically with a draft pick, and I expect them to do it uh, pretty early on, ahead of the, the top 50 picks. Okay. Uh, as far as wide receiver, uh, what's their uh, they, they did add uh, Zacchaeus uh, in mm -hmm. the slot. Uh, are they looking to go into the regular season with Zacchaeus as their starter, or do you think they're going to be looking to add another receiver early? Yeah, I think you'd be wise to add another receiver. The, the question there is, you know, is when you're talking about the slot receiver position mainly, right? Uh, Terry McLaurin obviously is your number one. Jahan Dotson comes in obviously as your number two, but then you could you could go ahead and, and look for a wide receiver target that's six two or taller. Right now, their tallest receiver in the room. They got a couple of six one guys, and that's the the maximum height they hit. Six two, not a whole lot taller, but it's taller than what you got. But you look at a guy like Troy Franklin out of Oregon, he's certainly uh, an interesting prospect that you could potentially add to this offense. But we know the Washington Bears want to push the ball down the field. So in some senses, the ability to get off the line, quickness in your in your route and in your stem and in your break and all that stuff matters more than maybe height, right? If you're if you're dropping touchdowns in from 30 yards out, you don't got to worry about goal line receivers. But you obviously are going to be in goal line situations. So you still want to have that tall guy if you can get them there and not just have to rely on guys like Zach Ertz to be your, your red zone target. So one way or another, again, I expect the Washington Bears to address the receiver position in the NFL draft. It's arguably the deepest draft position or position group in this class, the wide receivers. So, you know, it's, it's hard to say they have to go top 40, have to go top 100. But I certainly do expect them to do that. And I certainly expect Olamide Zacchaeus, if he is the starter in the slot when the regular season comes, it'll be because he earned it in training camp because uh, I think that he'll have some competition. Uh, Zach Ertz, uh, is that signing solidify the room or is that just an assurance and they're going to need to add a tight end at some point? Yeah, he's just a plug. I mean, you know, I don't know if he's going to be here for one year, two years. You know, the, the current contract's only for one year, but, you know, I, I don't know how much longer he's got in him to, to play in the NFL uh, as it is. But when you look behind him and John Bates, you know, John is has been a solid kind of dual skilled, you know, tight end. I think he's a better receiver than everybody expected when he came out of Boise State, but he's not. A great receiver you know by any means then you look at cole turner behind him out of nevada he's certainly a better receiver but you know his blocking has been suspect at best 
So in today's NFL, you need a guy out there that can do both, and you need a guy that can be a threat at both, which is why they went out and got Zach Ertz, because even if his play on the field isn't necessarily where it was at one point in time, his name still rings, uh, the reputation still precedes itself, and at the end of the day, he's going to be able to help those guys that are currently in the room, including a guy like Armani Rodgers, who missed all of last year and is trying to get better this year. But again, that's another position group that I think when you look at this year's tight end class, I think a guy like Kate Stover out of Ohio State is an interesting prospect to watch uh, late on day three. They don't really have an early or late on day two, rather. They don't really have an early day three pick because they traded their fourth round pick to the Seahawks in that uh, Sam Howell deal. So if they want, you know, a tight end that's kind of on the cusp day two, day three guy, they might have to reach into day two at pick number 100. So that's a spot where you could see a guy like Kate Stover come off the board if he's still there. All right. Let's uh, move on over to defense uh, for the last uh, five minutes or so here. And what do you have any idea what kind of defense they're going to run? Because Quinn has certainly made some changes to uh, his identity over the last uh, year or so. Yeah, he certainly has. I mean, back with the, the the Seattle Seahawks and the Legion of Boom, it was a lot of even front uh, cover three type of defenses, not a lot of blitzing, uh, but a lot of, you know, just kind of stacked boxes and things like that. And then you go to Atlanta and you see a lot of the same type of things. But then towards the end of his time in Atlanta, there's a noticeable switch to odd front defenses, a lot of three down linemen, more blitzing, some one down linemen, some two down linemen looks. Uh, some some interesting things there. And then you go to Dallas where he's obviously had a very successful run as the defense coordinator leading to his second chance to be a head coach. And it's the same thing. Odd front defenses are dominating his style of play right now. Blitzes are coming. Not as, you know, not as heavy as some other teams are blitzing, but certainly more than you saw in the Legion of Boom days. And I, I expect that to be the defense that you see here in Washington is more odd front. I don't think you're, you're outside of, you know, short yardage or goal to go. I don't think you should expect to see more than three down linemen at a time. I think you're going to see a lot of two. You're going to see a lot of one. You're going to see a lot of dudes standing up in the line of scrimmage. Some of them are going to come. Some of them are going to fall back. If you were watching the Philadelphia Eagles last year, part of the problem they had in their collapse is that the center, Jason Kelsey, and the quarterback, Jalen Hurts, were not on the same page on where pressure was coming from or where they expected pressure coming from to come from because a lot of teams started doing things like that where they were only giving them one or two down linemen. Everybody else was standing up. It's a lot harder to tell who's coming and who's not when they're not putting their hand in the dirt and kind of declaring themselves uh, at least a little bit. If guy drops back after his hand's been in the dirt, you're going to have at least a little bit of a hesitation in there. So I expect defenses in the NFL, honestly, to kind of just morph to that type of system anyway. But you've already seen Dan Quinn do that kind of stuff in Dallas. Joe Witt Jr. is going to be the defense coordinator. He's going to be calling the plays here in Washington. But he was on that staff with the Cowboys under Dan Quinn. So I expect it to be very aggressive. I wouldn't pigeonhole it into 3-4, three, 4-3, four, four, three, uh, anything like that. I'm just I would just tell you it's going to be very multiple. There's going to be a lot of different looks, and if they find a look that really messes with the quarterback's head the most, they're going to stick with it, and they're going to be incredibly aggressive. The signing of a linebacker like Frankie Louvu from the Carolina Panthers. Frankie Louvu, what he does best is pass rush. What, what he does bad is pretty much everything other than pass rushing. So I think <laughs> yeah. Frankie Louvu is going to be your Micah Parsons of the defense. Not to say he's going to be sure. that effective or have that, you know, not trying to put his name up there with that but that's going to be the style of play you're going to see from that guy he's going to be the hair on fire uh guy trying to attack the quarterback on every snap yeah as you can see just by looking at the depth chart uh a lot of aqua and that, those are all the new players the new free agents that have come yeah. in uh but uh we, we do not see a noticeable young uh, edge rusher like a, like a future mm -hmm. edge rusher you can count on that's your sack guy obviously luvu was probably going to be that guy to start with but dorance armstrong was a nice addition dante fowler and all that but do you think, and we talked about this on the other video, that this is going to be a high need for them in the draft? Uh, the edge group, yeah. I yep. think I think that, you know, Dor I like Doran's Armstrong. I did a film study on him for Locked On Commanders. I really liked what I saw. I really liked the potential there. The dude, he moves nice. Uh, he he works inside. He works outside. Really like that. But behind him, I mean, Cleveland Farrell, you know, he kind of just is what he is at this point in time. Never reached that full potential that the Raiders thought they were getting when they drafted him uh, back in 2019. But he's certainly a serviceable guy. Dante Fowler, again, he can serve a role. But what you really need is that disruptor, right? And, and, and Dorrance Armstrong certainly could still become that disruptor. But right now you look at the line and you just you have a lot of good dudes. You have a lot of decent players, a lot of guys that hopefully will play off of each other. Uh, but, you know, and there and there's a lot of value to that. Not everybody needs to be a superstar in the NFL. Uh, and, and maybe sometimes there's too many guys going out there trying to be superstars. Commanders fans know all about the kind of damage that can do when a guy's going out there looking to just be famous instead of making the right football play. 
But the bottom line is you still need to get that guy that every time a team looks at you on the schedule, they say, oh, man, we got to watch out for this dude, whether it's your yep. Joey Bosa's, Miles Garrett. You know what I mean? You need to get one of those guys. So while you're 100 percent correct, I don't think the Washington Commanders will be getting an edge rusher in the first round this year. Uh, you know, look, if they can go out there and get their quarterback early, package some picks, move into the first round, hopefully get another offensive tackle and then maybe be able to preserve that number 36 or number 40 pick in the second round, then you could look at an edge rusher. Uh, out there in, in that range, even in the third round, a guy like Adisa Isaac out of Penn State certainly has some potential uh, and could could develop down the road. But you, I do fully expect the Washington Commanders to prioritize that position uh, early on in the draft. All right, and then we wrap up with the secondary. And uh, question: Do you uh, have any idea how they plan on using Jeremy Chin? Uh, I think Jeremy Chin is definitely going to be more of a, a a linebacker than a than a than a than a safety. Like you can okay. look at him as a strong safety, certainly. But I think he's going to be much more of an intermediate, short area support type of guy. Probably going to see him on some blitzes. You might see him and Frankie move from opposite sides of the field onto some blitzes. But I expect him to be kind of a thumper uh, as much as he can be within the rules of the game uh, now. But that's that's kind of the role I expect Jeremy Chin to fill. All right. And then they all added a few other DBs, including Michael Davis. But still, mm -hmm. it looks like there's much more that's needed to solidify that back end. So what do you think? Who, who, what spot specifically do you think they need upgrades at? Uh I mean, everywhere, <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh my, I mean, that's not good. <laughs> you know, uh, Kendall Fuller, you know, left in free agency. He was probably the most consistent cornerback. Wouldn't call him a lockdown guy, but most consistent guy on the roster. Benjamin St. Juice regressed last year. Emmanuel Forbes was a first round, you know, pick who ended up, you know, at one point ended up benched. Uh, Quan Martin, you know, was brought in ideally to be the slot, ended up having to play free safety due to some injuries and all those things certainly did better towards the end of his rookie season. I think there's some potential there. But, you know, I don't know if this new defensive staff sees him as the free safety, sees him as a nickel. Derek Forrest was a guy who was on the rise, but he ended up injured last year and missed the rest of the season after his injury. So where is his health and where does this staff see him fitting in? And then again, you have Jeremy Chen, who you know kind of has a very specific skill set um, that you're going to use in a very specific kind of way. Uh, personally, I like Quan in the slot. If they can get him there and get him trained up, I like Derek to return to more of a free safety uh, type of type of role. Jeremy Chin is your strong safety, but then your outside corners. You mentioned Michael Davis certainly has some p potential there, but again, he's not a guy that you look at and just say, "Boom, that's your guy for the next three to five years." Emmanuel Forbes obviously has question marks. Benjamin St. Juice is playing on an expiring contract. I like a guy like T.J. Tampa out of Iowa State. You know, like every NFL draft class, there's a lot of ups and downs with people. Some people have T.J. as an early day two pick. I've seen him go as late as middle of the third round in some mocks. So depending on where he's available, if he's available, and how much the Washington Commanders believe or don't believe in the guys that they have on the roster already uh, will determine how and when they pick uh, that group. But I do, I believe they need some help in the cornerback room uh, specifically, could use some help in the safety room as well. Yeah, it sounds like to me basically that th this is going to take two off seasons of uh, yeah. adding talent, including through the draft. Uh, uh, quickly, the draft capital, mm -hmm. how is it? Um, it's good. You've got five picks in the first 100. You've got three on, on in the third round, two in the second round, one in the first round. Your day three is not as stacked. You know, no fourth round pick right now, but obviously a lot can change between now and actual Saturday NFL draft weekend showing up. But yeah, I mean, five five bites of the apple in the first 100 picks. And again, you could turn those five picks into three top 75 picks. You could, you know, keep them all. You can maybe trade back from 36 collect some more day two picks, stick at number 40. I mean, there's a lot of things that Adam Peters can do here. And the hard part about trying to project what he's going to do is he's a first-year GM. Yeah. Uh, we know John Lynch of the 49ers likes to play the draft trade game, but typically he's trading back and typically he's fleecing opposing teams uh, for, for extra picks. But, you know, still the potential to trade up here, I think. Uh, I wouldn't expect the Washington Commanders to sell off too many of their picks, uh, but I do think that the prospect of them moving two of those day two picks to try to get back into day one has the highest probability. And uh, they did make uh, uh, some moves on special teams because it was pretty bad last year. Mm -hmm. uh, they added a kicker. They added a long snapper. Do you think they're going to try to add a punter? I don't think they'll add a punter. I think Tressway is pretty solidified right there. I mean, his time is coming eventually. He's getting a little bit older. Uh, but I think right now, one, his leadership, two, his establishment on, on the team. I mean, he might be the most famous punter in the NFL you know, within its, within its own fan base. Um, so, you know, you move on from him. You better make sure you have a very solid plan. And when your other groups, other parts of your special teams unit are in question, uh, not, a, not a wise decision to do that yet.
All right. Sounds good. Appreciate it, David. Uh, looking forward again to wrapping it all up on the other side of the draft with you. And in the meantime, we're going to have uh, links in the description for all of your videos, including the one that's uh, airing right behind me. Uh, so I appreciate it. Uh, best of luck. What are you going to be doing with the show and the draft? You're going to be covering the draft live, anything like that, or just going to be doing some post uh, draft stuff. Yeah, so we'll be live. I'll be at the team facility during the NFL draft. So we'll be talking to the player that's drafted as they get picked. We'll be talking to the GM awesome. and the coach, you know, after every day. And I'll be before I leave the facility in Ashburn, I'll be dropping my episodes. So yeah, Thursday night or Friday morning, depending on what time it is when we get done with everything. Uh, and then same thing, Friday night, Saturday night. So all draft weekend we'll be dropping episodes. And then of course from there, it's depth chart previews and reviews and film studies. And then we've got rookie mini camp right after a few camps and then, you know, the long June before training camp comes. And before you know it, man, we'll be, we'll be talking about another Super Bowl. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, David, appreciate it. We'll talk to you again real soon. All right. Appreciate you.